So it is my great pleasure, everybody, to welcome you to this latest Social Contract Research Network seminar, uh, and indeed the last one for this year. It has been long in my mind that there's an Augustine-shaped hole in this seminar series, that, that St. Augustine would have interesting things to say about the social contract, and therefore I am absolutely delighted that we have uh, our first, but I hope not, not last, uh, presentation this evening that, that will touch upon some Augustinian ideas along with, with other ideas as well. Uh, and I'm therefore particularly excited uh, to be able to introduce uh, our speaker in a moment. Uh, for anyone who's new to the seminar, just let me uh, remind you how it works. Our speaker will speak for about uh, 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, if at any point you have a question that you would like to ask, can I invite you just to write a very brief version of it in the chat? Um, and then I'll call upon people at the end of the presentation in the order that the comments come through uh, in the chat. Uh, our speaker uh, tonight is Dr. Bolek uh, Kabala, uh, who's Assistant Professor of Political Science at Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas. And he also serves as a research associate at the Augustinian Institute uh, at Villanova University uh, after having completed his uh, PhD in political science at Yale in 2016. He's the lead editor of Augustine in a Time of Crisis, uh, Politics and Religion Contested, which came out with Palgrave in 2021, and Augustine Frontiers of Pluralism, uh, which was Routledge 2024. His current book project, Millennial Visions, Hobbes, Spinoza and the Return of Theological Politics, explores the dialogue between Hobbes and Spinoza and its impact on contemporary debates on public reason and secularization. Uh, and his title uh, for this evening or this morning's presentation is Of Contract and Covenant, Thomas Hobbes, Baruch of Spinoza and Augustine on social agreement and power. And so please, would you join me with, with me in welcoming uh, Dr. Bolek Kavala. Thank you so much for that uh, kind uh, introduction, uh, Dr. Watkin, Chris. It's been great to connect with you. Thank you for this generous invitation. Uh, and of course, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you as well. Uh, here, we chatted a few weeks ago, right as I was scrambling to finish my chapter on Augustine and time for our pluralism edited volume, and, and you provided some some really critical insights on Augustine and temporality. So I hope to also make use of those uh, here. Uh, thank you again. Just to acknowledge before I uh, share an outline, and I have uh, five points, uh, and I thought I'd go point by point, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge how fascinating it's been to learn about this uh, speaker series. And as I've gotten to watch a few of the uh, presentations <clears throat> to learn a little bit about Michel Foucault and his relation to social contract theorizing, which I wasn't connecting those dots uh, recently. I really uh, enjoyed that. I engaged with another uh, presentation on the thought of Michael uh, Serez and uh, Dr. Dr. Field, I also benefited really from, from your presentation. So what a wonderful uh, lineup. Again, what a privilege and an honor to be uh, a part of this. I'll be telling my colleagues and, uh, and students uh, to the extent that I can, uh, that this is something to tune into and, and, and just uh, disseminate information uh, about. So as I was going through the uh, some of the different presentations, Chris, I appreciate that you're referring to the opportunity to bring Augustine into these uh, conversations. I was also struck maybe that uh, covenants as if not an alternative, uh, then perhaps an older form or a refinement of the social uh, contract idea had been uh, discussed by by multiple speakers. I didn't think I haven't had the opportunity to watch uh, every single uh, presentation. But in addition to emphasizing uh, Augustine, by way of contrast uh, with uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, 
uh, Baruch Spinoza, and even John Rawls, uh, the 20th century return of social contract theory, I wanted to motion uh, towards uh, covenantal thinkers, uh, who of course include uh, Daniel Elazar uh, in the 20th century, uh, Michael Novak, Eric Vogelin, uh, depending on uh, who you ask, and of course I'm taking here uh, bits and pieces of, of Glenn Moot's uh, work, uh, although uh, others have now started to pay attention to uh, to Covenant. So uh, that's sort of just thematically, if I may, I wanted to move in the direction of Covenant as a possible refinement of the social contract idea. And yes, surprisingly, even though he's not discussed in uh, covenantal contexts, as much as I uh, think he should be. Uh, and I gave Glenn Moots a hard time about this, but Augustine, I think, emerges uh, as an interesting, maybe counterintuitive covenantal uh, thinker, providing a deeper, richer uh, understanding of uh, social contracts, uh, despite not being uh, seen that way. So let me go through the uh, five point uh, outline. Uh, and I thought I would just sort of sketch out uh, the, the areas I'd like to cover. So uh, first, just to say a couple words about why an alternative or a refinement uh, might be uh, needed. Uh, and I have in mind uh, Carol uh, Pateman's uh, work. She's also edited a uh, recent volume with uh, Charles Mills. Uh, <clears throat> so Pateman, of course, famously the author of The Sexual Contract. Mills authored uh, The Racial uh, Contract. And, and together, they've recently uh, join forces uh, to publish the contract and domination. So here's the basic idea. Here's the reason some of us might be looking for an alternative to social contracts. Contracts can be used as a cover or excuse for domination. They can mask disparities of power, unjust applications of power. And I think Pateman and Mills um, are onto that, <clears throat> uh, maybe in a dynamic that's recouped uh, in an interesting way uh, by Spinoza's critique of, of Hobbes. Uh, and so let me spend a little bit of time with that. The problematic aspect of legitimacy as deriving uh, from the agreement of uh, a majority or of a society-wide uh, consensus. And then I'll move, secondly, into sketching out some aspects of this covenantal alternative. Again, I'd like to mentioned brief points from the work of uh, Daniel Elazar, a great 20th century scholar uh, who taught at Temple, uh, among other places, uh, Eric Vogelin, uh, as well as uh, Michael Novak. Here in this second point, um, I'll identify three features of covenant that I'll argue make covenants an improvement over mere contracts when it comes specifically to this possibility of domination uh, that we're wanting to uh, avoid. Uh, and in this second point, uh, just by way of a, of a heads up, the three refining uh, principles as I refer to them um, are agreement that happens in the context of um, a higher power, which is associated with love. I think that that's evident in the Hebrew and Christian uh, examples. Uh, secondly, covenant, as opposed to contract, is significantly more open to informal uh, as well as formal uh, power. And I think the importance of informal influence, the importance of people, as opposed to just written text, uh, further reduces the risk of domination, even if it doesn't eliminate it uh, entirely. Uh, and thirdly, I'd like to uh, suggest covenants do a better job balancing uh, individual rights with, with community prerogatives uh, maybe than contracts themselves do. So, you know, partly these are my own reconstructions, if not precise definitions. And so I'll, I'll very much look forward to your feedback. So if that's the second part of the presentation, <clears throat> thirdly, I'd like to move into a discussion of Hobbes and why his understanding of society-wide foundational agreement, especially opens us to risks of, of domination, uh, and even some would say uh, tyranny. Fourthly, I'll consider his younger interlocutor, Baruch Spinoza, <clears throat> as a response who, very interesting to me because I wasn't thinking about this when I was writing on Hobbes and Spinoza, but Spinoza seems to push Hobbes in a covenantal 
direction. <clears throat> and of course, he <clears throat> recognizes the, maybe in a different way, maybe not, the sacred texts that were also of interest uh, to Hobbes. Uh, but Spinoza is more federal. Uh, Spinoza writes about the intellectual love of God. He's, maybe this is a Straussian reference, more erotic uh, than Hobbes. There, there's no mistaking uh, the references uh, to love and to federalism uh, in Spinoza. So this much is clear, but then I'd like to end with the Augustinian alternative and suggest that there are still issues with uh, 17th century thinker, who's the first theorist of uh, liberal democracy, we might say, Spinoza, and Augustine shows us how to address even uh, his uh, shortcomings. So this will be, I'll suggest, a late Rawlsian uh, reconstruction. I understand there's some skepticism about the notion of Augustine as a liberal of, of any kind, and I'll do my best to suggest that the late Rawls, not the early Rawls, has an interesting uh, key that we might uh, consider. Okay, so thanks for uh, bearing with me. That's the uh, outline. Let me move to this second area of the uh, presentation and ask, you know, how is it that social contract, the idea of agreement or society-wide consensus uh, might in any way lead to uh, oppression uh, or domination? Uh, before I do that, just a, a quick thought about this term domination, which according to uh, many theorists, is the number one, two, three uh, priority, um, or should be of our theorizing. Uh, others object maybe that there's uh, too much domination uh, talk these days. So before taking up this question, how can a social contract contribute to domination? What is domination? Just very briefly, and I'd like to you know, distinguish between domination and uh, interference. I think Philip Pettit uh, does a great job uh, with this. Uh, of course, he presents this uh, paradigm of uh, republicanism as non-domination in the late 90s as an alternative both to liberalism and communitarianism. Uh, communitarianism uh, at the time and since arguably associated uh, with the thought of uh, Michael Sandel. And so Pettit <clears throat> makes the point intervention perhaps involves an actual physical harm or intervention that's adverse uh, in the moment. Think of an abusive relationship. Uh, that's certainly problematic. Uh, but he argues it, it, it's not the whole picture. And this is where domination introduces some needed subtlety and refinement. Imagine an abusive uh, marriage where uh, <clears throat> one of the partners is not being uh, intervened with, uh, interfered with or physically upset uh, in any way, but where that could happen at any moment, given the cultural mores, given the way the relationship is uh, set up. Pettit makes the point, even in the absence of physical harm from moment to moment, somebody could be dominated uh, because of fear, because of the uncertainty that boundaries might be crossed um, at any given moment. So domination referring to uh, negative adverse uh, effects uh, on a person uh, that are not in their uh, control uh, and that are unjust, uh, that are clearly problematic. So how on earth could the social contract <clears throat> contribute to that kind of dynamic when after all, across the vast sweep of historical justifications for the setting up of uh, power, Social contract was meant to be democratic. It was uh, intended as an improvement over the arbitrariness of divine right uh, claims to rule or traditional uh, patriarchal uh, claims uh, to rule. What on earth are people talking about in suggesting that a social contract can lead to uh, domination? And this is where uh, I'm in the, the second area of the presentation. Carol Pateman's uh, work has uh, really been uh, eye-opening. Uh, of course, her uh, major work is the sexual contract, and she's taking issue with the Rawlsian version uh, of this justifying device in the 20th century, but she's happy to also uh, critique uh, Locke and Hobbes. Basically, the idea is <clears throat> this formal on-paper agreement, that's the contract, can have several blind spots. For example, even assuming that 
formally, all of us who enter into the public square are equal and have an equal voice in the setting up of institutions. <clears throat> it's possible to exclude women in multiple and myriad uh, ways. So for example, the formal contract might be in place and yet women might still be expected to provide labor in private in unfair ways. They might be expected to conform to uh, gender uh, roles uh, just in the way uh, that they interact uh, with others. <clears throat> there might be a further expectation of provision of social kinds of uh, labor, let's say in the workplace. Uh, that would be neither a, a, a private nor a, a fully uh, public space. But again and again, Pateman indicates uh, where the formal language of, okay, we all agree uh, on paper, that can miss areas where injustice is real uh, and, and people are subjected to power to which they in no way um, agreed. Charles Mills has done some interesting uh, work here, uh, maybe in a kindred uh, spirit. And so I do think it's, it's interesting uh, to see Pateman and Charles Mills uh, recently collaborate on this uh, uh, recent book that the, the title is The Contract and Domination, but Mills has applied the idea of a, a Kantian Rawlsian uh, blind spot to uh, race relations. And um, of course, uh, as he's uh, written in the racial contract, one example might just be, and it's kind of striking, in hundreds and hundreds uh, of pages over the course of his uh, career, John Rawls does not mention uh, Native Americans. How is it that a free society or a society that understood itself uh, as free going back uh, several centuries, and I'm thinking of the, the United States of America, Mills asks, also was uh, content through the, the 20th century to turn a blind eye uh, to the existence of uh, slavery and uh, segregation, perhaps to be conflicted about it, but not conflicted enough uh, that the institution uh, would be um, abolished. So um, it's a similar uh, kind of logic uh, in terms of reality on the ground for Mills um, that's oppressive and dominating, coexisting with formal guarantees that a social uh, contract uh, might make. It's a question of um, expectations uh, cultural norms that can coexist that are not abolished merely through the existence of formal guarantees of a social uh, contract. I think this makes intuitive uh, sense to us, even without the brilliant work of, of Mills and uh, Pateman. Of course, any student who's been through an introductory uh, political philosophy class recognizes that it was a democratic jury that puts Socrates uh, to death. <clears throat> uh, of course, you know, we're reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird uh, at, at the moment. Uh, and so, you know, <clears throat> there's a sense that I think people have intuitively that, you know, groups of people can become uh, mobs and in acting on uh, passions and impulses, even if there's majority support for, for measures uh, that are taken and there's no necessary legitimation and that's not to equate the social contract necessarily with majoritarian uh, democracy uh, but it's just to convey this uh, this sense that uh, i think we have uh, which is perhaps a society-wide agreement consensus that doesn't refer to norms outside of the consenting <clears throat> begs the question who's consenting and and who's uh, left out so <clears throat> let me move and this is the second half of the of the second point, so I need to be mindful of the time. But how might covenant be uh, an alternative, a refinement that reduces, although certainly it doesn't eliminate the potential for uh, domination? Uh, and just to take it uh, step by step and provide a, a couple examples of of covenants, uh, I'm thinking uh, certainly in the 20th century of uh, <clears throat> figures such as Daniel Elazar and Michael Novak. Um, <clears throat> so a covenant, <clears throat> especially as Elazar presents this, can mean uh, different things. So to start with the root words, 
Uh, in English Bibles, the, the Hebrew refers to, depending on who you ask, um, a cutting or uh, a binding. And Genesis 15, 9 through 10 seems uh, relevant right after being justified through faith. Abraham asks God for assurance of his commitment to, to, to Abraham and, and his people. And he receives, Abraham does a mysterious set of instructions. Uh, these are to bring a heifer, a female goat, and a ram, um, in addition to uh, a couple birds. Uh, to the camp and to cut them in half and, and kind of set them against each other. So there's a cutting that's involved. And then as uh, Abraham justified now falls asleep, it's not clear whether he sees this in a vision or whether it just happens as Abraham is sleeping, but a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch uh, symbolizing undoubtedly uh, <clears throat> God himself passes in between uh, the pieces. So uh, covenantalism in that sense, there's arguments about what exactly that symbolism uh, denotes, but <clears throat> there's a, a binding, there's a, a coming into and between uh, that symbolizes commitment. Uh, and these commitments uh, that are covenants, as explored by uh, Elazar, especially in the 20th century, can <clears throat> come in different forms. So they can be simply from divinity to human beings. They can be top down and examples might be the commitments that are made by divinity in uh, Genesis 15 to Abraham, to another uh, individual and his progeny. Uh, so Noah in Genesis 9 uh, and to King David in 2 Samuel 7. And at this point, it might be somewhat confusing to ask, how exactly is that a social contract or a refined social contract? It appears really to be a commitment that's being made by divinity to human beings. And this is where uh, one might say, well, let's slow down. There's other kinds of covenants and they reaffirm and, and replicate that idea of deep commitment. So, so that's important. You can have these agreements between two human beings. So of course, David and Jonathan covenant uh, with each other. They make a, a deep commitment to support one another. Uh, and then, yes, we do have examples of interpersonal deep commitments to pursue a shared purpose together that involve not just uh, God and uh, human beings, not just uh, two individuals, but a community that is now making a commitment in the presence of a higher power that's associated with love. And if you think of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Hebrew uh, scriptures, which of course show the... <clears throat> People of ancient Israel recently in captivity to Babylon, now returning, having to rebuild the walls of the city. How are they going to do that? How are they going uh, to commit? Well, there's an example of covenanting, and this is, this is the idea. So if we were to isolate <clears throat> three components of this kind of um, agreement, the covenant, which of course exists in the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures, and Elazar makes the point, it's not limited to those sacred texts. What are three components? Well, let me suggest these. <clears throat> whereas, so A, whereas a social contract might be exclusively for the sake of, of gain, <clears throat> there's a higher principle involved with uh, a covenant. There's either a higher power or God who's involved, and there's evidence of love and commitment, uh, whether that's in relation to the individual who's receiving the commitment, whether that's as a result of the shared project and what motivates people uh, to join forces. This is not just a question of utility. It's not just a question of making a buck. There's a deep abiding respect that's involved. Uh, there's love. So I, one of the Hebrew words that I think is relevant, shesed, refers to loving kindness. Uh, and perhaps we can acknowledge that. Secondly, <clears throat> this is not always a question of formal power. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Field's work uh, here, which has really made me think over the years, uh, informal power and influence really matters. And that's because people matter. So it can be indirect. It can be a question of culture over time. There isn't the requirement that this kind of agreement be spelled out and every last detail formalized uh, 
in writing. And uh, thirdly, and I think we'll see this, especially with uh, Spinoza, uh, but even with Augustine, who can be read in a federal way, federalism, I think, relates to covenants because covenants do a better job of balancing individual rights and community needs than contracts themselves, uh, which, which might not make that kind of uh, balancing happen. So these are just suggestions. And of course, I look forward very much to your uh, feedback, but with those sort of um, refinements, it's interesting uh, to consider, I think historically, where have we seen society-wide agreements that are undertaken in what is understood to be the presence of the higher uh, loving uh, power, where it's made explicitly clear this kind of agreement isn't just for the sake of escaping the state of nature and you know, moving from a, a state of insecurity to, to relative peace. There's, there's plenty of interesting historical examples. Of course, one could point to Puritans in the 17th uh, century covenanting not, so certainly uh, in England, when one thinks of the interregnum, the English Civil War, and Vogelin is clear that those kinds of covenanting, especially once they become eschatological, can become highly uh, problematic. So covenant is not a foolproof guarantee against other kinds of bloodshed or, or problems, but there's the Mayflower uh, Compact. Uh, of course, you know, fast forward to the 1760s, 1770s in, in the North American uh, colonies. And so there are actual historical examples. And the question would not be to replicate or try to recreate in the 21st century what those previous agreements looked like. The question might be, do they offer us resources to refine our own understanding of society-wide agreement today? So even for somebody who doesn't accept the metaphysics and the theology of Hebrew and Christian covenants, is there a way to pause and notice, okay, well, these are agreements, but they're also prioritizing some understanding of uh, love and respect, and they're also founded not just exclusively on individual rights, but but doing their best to incorporate the concerns of community uh, as well. If, if we could reconstruct our own understanding of society-wide agreement, drawing on resources that historical examples of covenant have to offer us, would that help us with dominating problems associated with the social contract tradition today? That's the question, uh, if, if not entirely my, my argument. So let me uh, move into the third area of this uh, discussion, and it, it would be to illustrate how an early uh, social contract uh, theorist, uh, Thomas Hobbes, actually, he presents a, a social contract. Of course, he's associated with that um, idea. What are some issues with Hobbes's uh, version? And of course, they were they were pointed out by uh, Baruch Spinoza in the in the 17th uh, century. <clears throat> I'll mention three works of Hobbes's that I'm relying on today. So uh, the Elements of Law, which is uh, penned by him in, in 1640, uh, De Kiwe, a 1642 uh, text, both of those written right as the English uh, Civil War is, is breaking. And then, um, of course, uh, Hobbes flees uh, to England as he's worried about the parliamentarian side associating him, I would think, rightly, just based on the ideas with uh, a monarchical uh, faction. And then by the time he writes Leviathan in 1651, Hobbes famously expresses a longing to come home. And the regime in England in 1651, so starting in 1649, but certainly by 1651, is uh, Oliver Cromwell's uh, Republican uh, regime. And yes, that experiment in republicanism moved quickly into the rule of uh, one. Not the first time the Republican experiments have moved in that direction, but I'll, I'll use Leviathan uh, as well. And, and people have speculated as to what the differences might be be between the elements and Dekiwe on the one hand, and then Leviathan, where Hobbes seems to accommodate Republican covenantal sensibilities a little more uh, perhaps. Hobbes does uh, distinguish between contracts and covenants. He uses that word, covenant. So a contract is an agreement, 
but there's a sense for the monster of Malmesbury, as he's known sometimes, that it has to be simultaneous. A covenant, as the author of Leviathan uses that phrase, allows one party to deliver later on. So there does seem to be more trust uh, involved. Uh, now, where we start to sense <clears throat> this is not a, a covenant that's saturated with deep uh, personal commitments, that's not motivated by love, we, we start to get that sense, I think, just in the way that Thomas Hobbes sets up the, the state of nature. And of course, we're familiar with the famous characterization, uh, life in this condition is nasty, poor, solitary, uh, brutish, uh, and short. Uh, and so people, for the sake of the killing and insecurity coming to an end, legitimately say, okay, let's agree to leave the horrors of this state so that commerce can ensue, so that civil life can uh, take place. I'm sympathetic to Michael Oakeshott's pointing out that Hobbes doesn't necessarily need to be read in an authoritarian, quote unquote, big government sense. Chapter 21 of Leviathan famously refers to negative liberty or the absence of interference so that people can lead their lives. And that's, of course, hard to do when there's so much insecurity that you don't know who's who's lurking um, around the, the corner. Now, people today do read Hobbes increasingly, I think, as either a political theologian or a legitimately covenantal thinker who's not just presenting a social contract motivated by nothing less than uh, a desire to have the killing stop, so to speak. But people read him, and I'm thinking of A.P. Martinich and Cody Cooper and maybe Amy Chandran uh, to an extent as somebody who is bringing about this society-wide agreement in the presence of a higher power, in the presence of divinity that is associated with love. The typical comment tends to be, go read part three and four of Leviathan. Scholars neglected that part of the work for forever, it seems. And surely uh, somebody like Thomas Hobbes would never write so much about uh, God without meaning it, uh, at least in part. Uh, and so therefore, if that's true, then we should understand the author of Leviathan, not just as a contract theorist, uh, but, but as covenantal in a more robust uh, sense of that word. And let me say a little bit about why I, I tend to disagree. Now, before even getting to my my main point of a disagreement here, and just to sum it up, it'll be, I don't see a lot of love in Thomas Hobbes's uh, works. And maybe that sounds trite and simplistic. I, I think it's true. Hobbes does define that effect uh, in elements of law. He does briefly mention it in Leviathan, his masterwork, but there's not the sense that love might actually motivate uh, people uh, joining uh, together, the discussion of Hebrew and Christian examples, as Thomas Hobbes is considering power relations between priests and kings and the setting up of Old Testament monarchies, there's just not the same attention drawn to love that Hobbes, excuse me, that Spinoza uh, will provide. So the different treatment by Hobbes and Spinoza of relevant passages in the Hebrew text is striking. Spinoza finds love there in the Hebrew scriptures, and Hobbes uh, does, does not. Uh, but before really driving that point home, I, I will say part of the movement towards maybe seeing Thomas Hobbes as more of a covenantal thinker has come, and she can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, I think from Dr. Fields, a brilliant work as she's uh, pointed out, you know, you do have two different kinds of influence in the works of, of Hobbes uh, alongside that social contract. You do have formal power, which is uh, potestas, uh, the Latin uh, phrase. And, and this has to do with just who's in control, who's in charge on paper. Uh, but then especially by Leviathan, by 1651, it seems potentia or informal power spontaneous, indirect ways in which people interact and can exert power uh, 
uh, even when that goes against the formal rules, we see evidence of that uh, as well. Where does that come up, especially in Leviathan? Chapter 22 has a discussion of, quote, system subject, political and private. Uh, so these might be potentially trade associations. Uh, they might be other kinds of partial associations. Now, in theory, on paper, none of them have any authority whatsoever without the sovereign bestowing it and conveying it. Uh, but I think uh, Dr. Field has shown, is it conceivable that on the ground, there's some informal power that creeps in, the power of people to resist what the legal center hands down? That is, that is thinkable. So the political theological thrust of Hobbes literature, this openness to informal power, uh, perhaps makes us consider Hobbes might not be as merely contractual as he's been supposed to be. It may be that there's potential to read his version of social contract in a richer, uh, more robust sense. Uh, but I would really quibble with that because, again, uh, love seems so important to me in any account of, of, of covenant. And I, I don't see that. Again, there's a, a brief definition of the emotion, of the effect in uh, the elements uh, of law. Um, very clearly, the primary motivation to leave the state of nature is not a sense of security, a sense of God's commitment, a sense of wanting to join uh, together in a mutual project of rebuilding any kind of wall. It's just fear. And as I transition to Spinoza, the fourth part of this presentation, I think Hobbes' younger interlocutor, somebody who died tragically enough in his uh, early 40s uh, in the Netherlands, he had to support himself, Spinoza did, through uh, lens grinding uh, after he was uh, excommunicated uh, from his own religious community for indulging what were considered heterodox um, ideas. Uh, Spinoza, I think, nails this when he points out there's a real potential for the Hobbesian framework to devolve into domination, uh, to exacerbate problems of oppression. And it's precisely because even though, uh, yes, there's a society-wide agreement, there's a social contract, it could be one person in that office. And that really opens the floodgates to, I mean, the classical word is tyranny, uh, but we might say oppression and, and domination. And so, so what if you have a formal social contract, uh, Spinoza asks in, in two of his uh, major works, the, the TPT, Theological Political Treatise, uh, and the PT, the Political Treatise, which he never finished. So what if that formal contract is in place but in reality, it allows for the arbitrary rule of um, one, one alone. Um, and so let me, let me move into this uh, discussion of Spinoza, who also theorizes a society-wide um, agreement, uh, but who it definitely includes more of these three refining covenantal elements uh, that I mentioned as potentially improving how we can understand uh, social uh, contract. So let me start with just the presence of this higher principle or love. It is unmistakable uh, in Baruch uh, Spinoza's uh, works. So, you know, both in his earlier uh, book, the, the TPT, which is published in 1670, where Spinoza takes the first 15 chapters to theorize not a state of nature, but to understand scripture as an object of nature. Uh, this is his revolutionary way of understanding a sacred text. So get to know its history. Uh, <clears throat> don't start with, with the claims that it's uh, revealed, but, but get to know its history. Spinoza moves in chapter 16 of that early work into a discussion of the uh, social contract. And here he's been contrasted uh, with Hobbes uh, first and foremost, uh, in the political philosophy literature, because of how he defines uh, right. Uh, and so Spinoza is just very clear and explicit uh, about the fact that for him, might makes right. And famously, the, the passage in chapter 16 of the TPT is big fish eat little fish by the, the right of nature. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, in the political treatise published in 1677, 
Spinoza also uh, presents um, a contract. And there's some uh, ideas about communities and the setting up of communities through contract. Interestingly enough, in book four of the ethics, the ethics, a significantly more complicated work, I think, which has not been associated usually with uh, political ideas by Spinoza scholars. So let me give Stephen Smith a lot of uh, credit here. So yeah, let's start with love, which seems absent from Hobbes's works, and it's all over Spinoza's uh, books. And so starting at the end of the ethics, where it seems to appear in a non-political context that might not have to do anything with the founding of communities, but Spinoza refers to it as the intellectual love of God. Uh, and it's <clears throat> hard to know exactly uh, what he means. Certainly, it seems not to refer to a transcendent divinity that stands uh, outside the world. Uh, but in terms of this component of what a covenant brings to the table over and above a contract, Spinoza just again and again at the end of book five, almost rapturously, almost forgetting himself, writes about the importance of this uh, emotion. And it seems to be associated with the appreciation, the deep sense of appreciation that a philosopher has in contemplating everything uh, that there is. Uh, Spinoza has the uh, both uh, challenging and some ways maybe frustrating identification that he offers of God with the world in his work. So he's seen as a pantheist, although somebody like Ed Curley uh, has has pushed back and argued there's a there's a theistic way to to read Baruch uh, Spinoza. So this love of nature, this loving appreciation of nature, also uh, shows up in the earlier work, uh, the the TPT. In chapter four, and Spinoza claims to uh, uncover it in the, the Hebrew and Christian uh, scriptures. So it's the apostles, especially, uh, whom he associates with the intellectual uh, love of God. And then strikingly, I think the connection to politics comes in some out of the way propositions uh, in book four uh, of the ethics. And just to read out um, a few of these. I'm referring uh, especially to uh, Proposition uh, 35 in Book 4, uh, insofar as men live in obedience uh, to reason, they always necessarily agree in nature, and it turns out there's emotions for Spinoza that are more active and more consistent with reason uh, than others, and so Spinoza continues in Proposition 37, the good which every man, if he follows after virtue, desires for himself, he will also desire for other men. And so much the more in proportion as he has a greater knowledge uh, of God. Uh, and then finally, love is mentioned explicitly in Proposition 46. He who lives under the guidance of reason endeavors as far as possible to render back love or kindness, even for other men's hatred, anger, or contempt towards him. And so we just don't see this in the discussion of the founding of a, of a Hobbesian uh, community uh, love is present uh, in Baruch Spinoza's works, and it is plausibly there in book four of the ethics tied to the setting up um, of uh, political uh, society. So certainly Spinoza brings this to the table. There is absolutely the emphasis on uh, informal uh, power uh, as relevant. Uh, and then in terms, and, and much more so, I think, than uh, is the case with Thomas Hobbes. So Baruch Spinoza famously suggests democracy is the better way to go. He's the, the first thinker, uh, really, uh, I guess, in what's sometimes referred to as the tradition to say democracy, really, a, a diffusion of power through society is the sustainable way uh, to maintain institutions. And Spinoza does this based on uh, a contract, uh, based on prioritizing informal power in this way, how does he balance individual rights and, and community needs uh, in a way that maybe a straightforward understanding of uh, just the social contract uh, would not? Well, he's a proponent of federalism, which the history of, of covenantalism highlights uh, that idea. So power sharing across multiple spheres of uh, authority. And Elazar makes the case this existed in ancient Israel. If one thinks of the tribes together, forming a sovereign uh, collectivity. So Spinoza's home country of the Netherlands itself featured uh, some federal institutions. Uh, and in the political treatise 
uh, which Spinoza tragically enough never never finishes. He never finishes the chapter on democracy. There's a reaffirmation of why federalism or power sharing is valuable and why it's uh, important. There's not just uh, one solution necessarily to impose across the whole of uh, society, but but government and communities should have some leeway and should have some prerogatives. So the best thing to do is to have multiple communities set up among which individuals uh, on some level uh, can choose. And so we do see federalism in Spinoza. And for me, it's very hard to discern it in Hobbes. So let me move to this final part of the presentation. Thanks for your uh, patience. Let me just check in. Are we doing okay with, with time? Do I have 10 more minutes maybe? We fine. Okay, great. So issues with Baruch Spinoza's democratic quasi-covenantal recasting of Thomas Hobbes's uh, approach. What might be uh, the issues uh, still that Augustine refines further that he allows us to see uh, more clearly? Uh, and so I would start with that very equation uh, that I mentioned <clears throat> from chapter 16 of the TPT as uh, Baruch Spinoza is explicitly uh, theorizing uh, a social contract. And it's the idea that might uh, makes right. And <clears throat> that could have implications of liberation. And I, I think Spinoza believed that the proposition did if we're considering the power of a collectivity face to face with an individual who is uh, seeking to uh, oppress. Uh, but perhaps that notion uh, that might make might might makes right and that big fish eat little fish by the by the right of nature also has some negative and disturbing uh, implications. I mean, how exactly is this different from the amoralistic uh, approach of Thrasymachus in the Republic or of Plato has uh, the dialogue, uh, Gorgias, any of the ancient rhetoricians who equated uh, might with, with right. And of, of course, we're, we're familiar with historical examples uh, in, in the 20th century where that seems to be a problematic uh, proposition. So what if the reasonable multitude, even for a time, is not the most powerful actor or entity? Doesn't the foundation itself despite all the language uh, of love and despite the emphasis on informal power, uh, couldn't that be really problematic? And by the way, I forgot to mention uh, Spinoza is so open to the possibility of informal influence that by the time he gets to the political treatise in 1677, a social contract has dropped out of the picture entirely. There seems to be a transition from the state of nature to society without any actual point of demarcation. Uh, but so the ontology is perhaps questionable uh, for some. <clears throat> this is where I think uh, Augustine uh, comes into the, the, the picture and you know presents a, a different version of uh, a divinity, a different way to understand God. So uh, <clears throat> with all due respect to, to Edwin Curley, I think pantheism is the straightforward way uh, to read uh, Baruch uh, Spinoza, uh, so there's there is a logic of of imminence, and again, while that can be uh, liberating if the transcendent power is an individual on the outside who's a, who's oppressing, Augustine might ask whether not having uh, an outside standard also uh, can be uh, can be problematic. So, in moving towards an Augustinian version of uh, consensus or covenant. Uh, let me acknowledge <clears throat> this has not been the typical way to read even um, Augustine. There's not an explicit discussion uh, in the City of God uh, in any of the major works of people just agreeing uh, and moving from a, a state of nature to society. Certainly that is that is not there. Uh, a thinker like Elazar in the second volume of uh, covenant and uh, Commonwealth acknowledges Augustine as a great covenantal thinker, but doesn't say too much about that. So it's uh, an intriguing reference uh, in passing. Where exactly is the contractual uh, element in Augustine's uh, work? This seems uh, challenging and, and like it might be an uphill uh, case uh, case to make. <clears throat> 
And so, of course, I, I, I would like to mention uh, the distinction the Bishop of Hippo makes at the end of Book 14 of the uh, City of God uh, between uh, the City of Man and the, the City of God. But that <clears throat> potentially increases uh, our frustration uh, because those two ways of understanding society and institutions are not necessarily agreeing, contracting, or covenanting uh, with each other. <clears throat> the city of man for Augustine could be set up in any number uh, of ways. So can the, the group of people he refers to as the, the city of God. Thinkers like Veronica Ogle have mentioned Augustine seems very uninterested in politics on, on many levels. He seems to bring about a, a depoliticization, which was also Hannah Arendt's point. So understanding him as a social contract theorist or a covenantal thinker, uh, where do we see this? And I'm moving towards book 19 of the, of the City of God. And I'd like to mention two contemporary authors who actually indicate their view that he's not just a social contract uh, theorist, uh, but that he's a Rawlsian, uh, or that he can be reconstructed uh, as uh, a Rawlsian. If that seems really counterintuitive, uh, Exhibit A is uh, is Paul Weithman, uh, <clears throat> currently at the University of uh, Notre Dame. His colleague Ed Santuri has also uh, pushed in this uh, direction, understanding Augustine along uh, liberal uh, social uh, contract lines. Both of them uh, make a, a, a great deal out of Book 19, Chapter 17, and they refer to the overlapping consensus that Augustine presents. Where do we see that in uh, Book 19, uh, Chapter uh, 17? Well, Augustine presents a discussion of two important uh, social groups, pagans and Christians, and very explicitly he avoids what has been referred to as the Theodosian alternative uh, there. So Emperor Theodosius uh, was, was known for advocating a strategy, of course, of uh, the Roman state uh, advancing, propagating uh, the Christian uh, church. In chapter 17, Augustine explicitly rejects and avoids uh, that strategy and asks, why is it that both Christians and pagans are able to commit, able to support uh, the Roman Empire. And the answer actually sounds kind of Hobbesian. It's strange. The, the basic answer is uh, security, and the framework of the empire provides that for Greeks, uh, Romans, and Christians. Now, the motivation uh, might still ultimately be different in terms of why those goods, those basic goods, are important. Uh, so, you know, Greeks and Romans uh, might pursue them uh, in and of themselves, whereas uh, for Christians, of course, as Augustine understands this, the temporal goods provided by the empire merely help along the way to the ultimate uh, destination. Uh, but that's why it's an overlapping consensus. And uh, Paul Weithman and Ed Santuri uh, both both use this uh, phrase. Uh, it's a reference uh, to John Rawls, who, of course, famously in the 20th century, brings back contract theory as an alternative to utilitarianism, natural law uh, theorizing. Um, and he does this first and foremost uh, in his book, um, A Theory of Justice, uh, which he modifies uh, later uh, in important ways. Uh, but, you know, A Theory of Justice uh, is, the, is the major uh, text. And Rawls imagine, asks us to imagine uh, before institutions of society are set up being in an original position where we'll have no idea what role we're, we're occupying later in uh, society. And precisely because we don't know, we'll want to set up institutions and even distribute wealth in a way that's uh, fair and uh, not, uh, not oppressive. Uh, so there's obviously some huge problems with with seeing um, Augustine as a as a Rawlsian, uh, and I'm I'm not sure that I I fully buy the uh, suggestion. But let me just start with these three refining elements of of covenant that I've suggested at the beginning are not present in contracts, and ask where do we see evidence that Augustine might be open to a society wide agreement in the presence of a higher principle that is also associated with love, where might we see 
Augustine associated with informal and uh, not formal power? And how might it be that he balances individual rights and community needs better than a typical social contract uh, theorist? Well, of course, love <clears throat> is you know even more ubiquitous in Augustine's works than it is in uh, Spinoza's. Uh, the Confessions <clears throat> describe Augustine's journey uh, towards God as he's, as he's drawn uh, by divine uh, love. But importantly, in a political context, the end of Book 14 of City of God gets at this question of motivation. And if Hobbes prioritizes uh, fear in leaving a state of nature, if Spinoza is somewhat open to love as a motivating factor at the beginning of political communities, Augustine says it is the defining motive of anybody who's in the city of God, which of course refers not to a, a geographical uh, polity. It does not refer in book 14 of Augustine's major work to those who uh, make, it, make it to heaven. It, it references Christians anywhere and uh, everywhere. And their end, their political end, as Augustine uh, sees it, is the opposite of, of domination. Uh, they're drawn uh, to relate to each other uh, for the sake of glorifying God, uh, for the sake of uh, loving God and each other uh, better. Uh, so there's, uh, there's certainly that. Informal power, I think, runs throughout the city of God insofar as there isn't really an explicit discussion of constitutionalism or formal on paper limitations of government. Again, Augustine seems uninterested in politics in many respects, but again and again, there is the interest in people. So as he describes his relationships in uh, the confessions and even writes uh, about grieving uh, excessively uh, for friends who have uh, passed away, uh, <clears throat> Augustine seems to take uh, the importance of informal power even beyond where centuries later Spinoza takes it, hence maybe his lack of interest in the question of uh, the regime. Formal power almost doesn't seem to matter for Augustine because God and people uh, do. Uh, and then finally, uh, evidence of uh, support for federalism. Again, it has to be somewhat reconstructed. And uh, Paul Miller does this in a, in a chapter uh, in the edited volume, Augustine in a, in a Time of Crisis, the way that uh, Paul Miller in that book suggests Augustine would have supported uh, the power sharing of federalism is indirectly, it's an indirect argument that goes to Augustine's very pessimistic view of human nature. Uh, and think back in the Confessions to the story of stealing pears, which Augustine engages in that activity by his own admission, just to experience transgression, or think about his, this keeps me up at night, his description of infants uh, crying, it's not that they're cute, Augustine says, that's original sin. And so Paul Miller takes that emphasis on human depravity and, and says, if you're an Augustinian, all you're interested in doing politically would be setting up a minimal framework of laws that protects negative liberty and keeps uh, people from interfering with, uh, with each other. So I think there is a way to reconstruct Augustine as a uh, as a supporter of uh, federalism. Just a final point, because the objection I haven't mentioned yet to a Rawlsian social contract kind of Augustine uh, is staring us in the face. Rawls says you can't make religious arguments in public. At least he does in a theory of justice. And so uh, therefore, I think it's fair to ask Paul Weithman and Ed Santori, how on earth could you attempt to reconstruct Augustine along social contract, and I'm suggesting uh, covenantal uh, lines. Again and again, Augustine clearly supports using religious arguments in public, in his correspondence uh, with statespeople, in the advice that he gave uh, to soldiers in the uh, Roman army. Again and again, he does not insist on anything remotely approaching a Rawlsian restriction on religious reasons that could be shared in public. So, how might one potentially, if there's an overlapping consensus in book 19, how might one salvage a Rawlsian reconstruction? And I think the answer has to do with a, a difference between the early and the late Rawls. So by 1997, uh, in a famous article uh, that he published in the University of Chicago Law Review, uh, 
John Rawls introduced what he referred to as the proviso to his insistence on uh, public reason, uh, a, an exception, if you will, uh, a, a qualification. And by 1997, uh, no doubt, as he maybe saw uh, the fortunes of secularization uh, theory, and I think Rawls was not alone in this, by the late 90s, Peter Berger was also revising some of his views on, on secularization. But Rawls says, you can come into the public sphere and share a religious reason, provided that, here's the proviso, at some point, you translate it back into public reason or non-religious uh, speech. And what strikes me and what has struck some of my co-authors is at no point does Rawls specify what the time frame might be at some point. Well, at some point might be in a few weeks. It might be a few months. Uh, theoretically, it might be uh, in a few years. And that time might extend out indefinitely. Uh, and so <clears throat> it may be that Rawls in his later years was more open to uh, a, a more significantly religious public square uh, than he's given credit for uh, for accepting. So <clears throat> in all those ways, even though Augustine doesn't explicitly ever discuss constitutions or, or social contracts, I wonder, given some of the issues and some of the potential for domination that we do have in social contract theory, uh, whether it doesn't behoove us to refine our understanding of society-wide agreement by moving towards a covenantal uh, model, uh, by uh, considering uh, those examples of society-wide agreements that include, incorporate a higher power that prioritize love, that prioritize informal as well as uh, formal power. Uh, and if that's true, uh, then I, I think there are some resources that we could uh, draw on uh, from the works of Augustine. So thanks so much for your attention and your patience and very much look forward to your feedback and questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bollock, for that really, really rich uh, presentation. Very um, much material for us to get our teeth into. Um, let me just reiterate, if you would like to ask a, a question, uh, please uh, note uh, in the chat, and I will call on people in the order in which those come. And I can see that the first one has just popped up. So I will uh, cede the floor to uh, Sandra for the first question. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Get my okay. volume. I'm going to try to make it a little louder, but I can hear you just fine. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Just uh, I spend time in my house as you'll have seen the <laughs> children yeah. coming past. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here because um, Bollock has is one of my the best people who's engaged most carefully with my work. So I'm very um, you know, happy to be here and see you kind of face to face. Um, so I had a bit of a question about um, the framing of this. And so I see this sort of distinction between a more sort of a contract, which could be a contract amongst others. It's just quite uh, instrumental, perhaps, you know, nothing necessarily in it, and this sort of higher sense of a covenant. But the way you led into that was hoping that this would address issues of domination, of contracts of domination, like what Mills and Pateman talk about. And I was kind of thinking about this and I was musing. And I think so Pateman talks about the sexual contract both in a sort of abstract way, the same abstraction as the social contract, except that it's um, about what happened to the women. But then she also thinks it has a, um, a contemporary echo, a concrete echo in marital contracts, particularly under um, the doctrine of coverture. So that we're, and so she thinks that, that the abstract theoretical thing is echoed in this real life thing. She's very interested also in uh, contracts, yeah, these sorts of real world contracts that somehow echo the theoretical structure. But I was thinking about the marriage contract. And so this is both the contract of domination par excellence for her. She thinks it's, you know, actually she gives you some of the actual legal history of it and it's um, yep. similarities with the slave contract. But it's also the classic contract before God, right? Appealing to it. So, so I wondered whether, um, and so I don't know quite what to do with that, but it was interesting that the, the very, one of the ideas most closely associated with the problem you're setting up is also tangled with the thing that you're presenting as a solution so I'm, I'm so curious what you make about that so that's and so if i have another one should i say that now chris or do you want me to hold off with a different I have um, a why that? don't you ask both your questions in one shot uh, okay. and then um bollock can 
yeah. take them one at a time. Sure. And so I also was um, thinking as well about this question of whether thinking about informality, informal power as opposed to strict juridical power as a um, what, what sort of political valence this has. Now, certainly when it comes to thinking about questions of democracy in Spinoza, it seems to have this positive valence that's basically by when you think about what concretely is possible for a sovereign, that sort of brings it all down a notch from the authoritarian sort of model that you're given by Hobbes. That's the general vibe. But it seems like the political logic of informal power is quite two-sided in the sense that, okay, under certain circumstances, that'll be the case. But also, if people are clearly different in power, then they then it sort of almost flips the other way. It's like then they naturally are dominated. And he said well, um, both Spinoza's interest in the status of women and servants is like, well, there's so much, you know, they're so much weaker, so therefore they should be dominated. And so um, my children were floating around, so I'm not sure whether you did something with that, but it seemed like this question of informality is not, it has this sort of ambivalent what it does, what it does for you. And um, rela related to that, it seemed that this question of federalism, I think if you're, what you're referring to in Spinoza is this idea that he says, well, look, you know, you can imagine a good aristocracy where the parish, all the cities have a bit of power. But that's if the cities are equal. If there's not equal cities, one of them should be in charge and everything else should be deferring to it. So I feel like, yeah, so my two is, what do you make of these concrete covenant before God of marriage, which is also a domination yes. covenant? Yeah, yeah. And the other question is, what do you take, make about this uh, extreme ambivalence politically of informal questions? <laughs> but yeah, thank you Absolutely. very much. Very rich talk. No, no. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And your questions are very much uh, with me. And so Pateman uh, especially has been eye-opening and I recognize I need to immerse myself going forward in her uh, uh, work, but certainly, and I, I could have mentioned, I think Richard Furman uh, as well, a, a, a Baptist minister in South Carolina in the 1830s and, and 40s, who explicitly, when we talk about the positive good school uh, of slavery, explicitly, tragically uses uh, scripture, uh, including, you know, covenantal notions uh, to, to justify something absolutely um, horrific. So, uh, yes, is there uh, the potential for uh, abuse? <clears throat> uh, absolutely. And, you know, if I haven't grappled with that sufficiently, then I, I, I think I absolutely uh, need to. What if, as I think you're suggesting, um, and as Pateman documents legally and historically, the presence of that higher loving uh, power makes oppression, domination worse by sacralizing things or by lending that kind of uh, justification to uh, a power uh, disparity. Uh, so, you know, certainly that's very real uh, historically as a uh, as a question, and it's a it's a possibility. And I'm not sure how to think through. Of course, I, I recognize there's no guarantee. However, we imagine our social contract or society-wide uh, agreement, there, there's no guarantee that we'll make it into a domination-free space or entirely avoid uh, any risk of, uh, of injustice. But I'm struck that, and, and this is by way of analogy, let me mention an article I wrote on uh, Augustine and, and Philip Pettit that I managed to have, I had the good fortune of its publication in, in PRQ. Uh, but, but my answer, I guess, would be, sort of selective appropriation uh, and, and using these thinkers as, as resources for us. And I wonder whether that's possible. So Pettit, of course, has this you know paradigm of republicanism as uh, non-domination. And it struck me that you know perhaps he could have devoted more space in his book and uh, the, the articles after, after the 1999 book to considering how are people dominated through rhetoric um, occasionally, right? There's not a lot of discussion in his work of the use of words as contributing to people feeling uh, excluded or uh, feeling in, in those ways. And, and so I said, you know, <clears throat> Augustine at the end of De Doctrina Christiana offers a very distinctive model of, of rhetoric, which rejects in many ways what would have been his classical inheritance. And he counsels using words in, in simple, unadorned, truth-oriented, uh, ways, uh, and I made the case uh, 
whether you agree with all of Augustine uh, or not, the metaphysics and the theology, selectively appropriating that aspect of, of his work. So an emphasis on using a simple, clear, truth-oriented words, however you understand truth, that might strengthen Philip Pettit's paradigm of republicanism as non-domination. And I wonder whether a similar move might not be possible here. So it's not necessarily that <clears throat> how in setting up our understanding of the social contract <clears throat> and making sure that there's some element of loving respect for other people uh, there, I don't think I'd want to insist that that has to be Yahweh or Jesus or anybody's specific understanding of uh, divinity, but I wonder whether having a higher principle that's involved today, whether that might not uh, be helpful, especially when that's combined with a respect for people, which I understand informal power making possible. And I'm about to get to your, your, your second question, but so bringing in a higher principle that's loving, you know, recognizing that we don't need to write and spell everything out because people really matter. And so there should be a personal dimension and then trying to spread power around. I wonder whether one couldn't say that more often than not, or probabilistically in 2024, it might help a little bit to incorporate those elements or to try to incorporate them into how we understand society-wide agreement. Let me pause and see, is that addressing your, your question at all? Yeah, so so I mean I, I I'm I'm all on board with selective appropriation. Um, okay. And okay. But just but just um so that 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 that's I'm totally fine with that. But um I just yeah I'm still uh how you make it be selective and not bring its baggage in the appeal to the but I mean I think that's something that I'm happy to you know we can continue the conversation about and see exactly Abs how absolutely you and that I, and I need to think that through. So I appreciate it. With respect to the question about informal power. Absolutely. And let me say, those of us who are surveying the political scene, you know, whether it's a, a populism of, of the right or the left, uh, it seems, you know, informal power, personalism certainly is not reassuring to everybody. If anything, the formalism of, you know, <clears throat> procedural guarantees and constitutional safeguards that, that seem to be undermined in many ways, I think by uh, by populism, which which may be on the right on the rise, uh, you know certainly in informal power could cut the other way, and so uh, it it it's not a a guarantee. Again, maybe it's bringing it back to the historical moment. I think for for Spinoza, that way of understanding influence is a necessary corrective to what he sees as the tremendous concentration of power that that Hobbes might. Uh, bring about. And so <clears throat> he's making a bet. I think we always make some kind of bet or wager in, in how we propose imagining or reimagining concepts. But it seems, you know, for the author of the TPT, the informal power of the people over time will lead to better outcomes than the formal entrusting of one power center with all authority. And so would Spinoza have said that a multitude can never act in an unjust way or that informal power potentia would, would never have negative consequences? I don't know that he would say that as a foolproof guarantee, but in his historical situation, my read is he thought that was a safer bet. Uh, and so I, <clears throat> you know, and it may be interacting with, with, you know, different students at, at different kinds of institutions and being being struck in a way that I haven't adequately justified, you know, why do I think young people who are you know, very much into the idea of consent as, uh, and, and, you know, the most important society-wide consideration, you know, can I fully justify why they might be better off, you know, refining their understanding of uh, consent uh, through, incorporating some emphasis on love and respect for uh, human beings and not spelling everything out. You know, I, I may not have justified that fully, but I, I think it's a bet that I feel kind of like I would want to make uh, today. 
So does that start the conversation a little bit uh, by way of a response? <clears throat> Sandra, if, if you would like a follow-up, just sort of nod vigorously otherwise. Um, you're good. You're good. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I wonder if I might jump in um, with a, a question of my own, not, not half as well formulated as Sandra's, I'm afraid, but I'll, I'll just try and pull together a few sort of incohate thoughts that I was having um, uh, during what was, was a very lucid and persuasive um, presentation. So it's not incohate because of the presentation. It's just that I'm, I'm trying to pull together what I'm thinking about these things. Um, the thoughts around the question of what, what really is the difference between contracts and covenants? And are they quite as rigorously distinct as some people have, have argued and, and, and as we might think? Um, and, you, you know, you rightly point out Hobbes, Hobbes uses the language of covenant more than he uses the language of contract, you know, by a factor of, you know, at least two to one in Leviathan. And uh, which, of course, raises a question, yes, but does he mean by those two terms what we would intuitively think them to be. Um, and, and I wonder if what we can minimally draw from that is at least that, that these are not oil and water ideas, that, that there is some leakage, some overlap perhaps uh, between them. And if you think back to, you know, Roman law, that the, the gods are involved in contracts, you know, oaths are taken in the presence of gods and so forth. And so there isn't some hermetic seal between covenants and contracts in, in that tradition. You think of medieval canon law and the way in which contracts are, uh, you, you know, made before God and enforced, we, we are accountable to him for them. Um, and I suppose the, what I'm trying to wrestle with is, do contracts make sense without covenants, historically speaking, um, and, and logically, structurally speaking? And is it, is there a spectrum? So rather than thinking about these things in terms of black and white, over here there's contracts and they're one thing and then over here there's covenants, there's something completely different. Uh, are there a spectrum of agreement, agreements with a sort of contracting tendency on one side and a covenantal tendency on the other, but it gets a little bit messy in the middle and you can't quite work out what, what particular uh, agreements are? And should we, so this is the final, the final sentence, should we think of covenants as contracts plus in other words contract is the base concept and then in order for it to be a covenant you add on you know morality and so forth or should we think of contracts as covenants minus in other words the covenant is the original um sort of base concept and what a contract does is it tries to to excise or to subtract all the sort of religious paraphernalia and end up with a purely legal agreement. So all of this is trying to get at what, what do you see as the relationship between contracts and covenants? No, and I really appreciate that. I'm very drawn and attracted to the idea of degree for, for various reasons that I've, I've started to explore uh, in my work, and that I, I think might actually be uh, supported by uh, by Spinoza, but but certainly the idea that this is not a binary uh, resonates with me, and I, I should have been more explicit uh, about that, so that it it's not uh, a, a one or a, a zero, and that's part of the <clears throat> thinking. I just in terms of the progression of of thinkers. I mean, I, I did go Hobbes to Spinoza chronologically, and then. Uh, I guess back in time to uh, Augustine, but I think it is possible to say that there's degrees of that older understanding of of covenant uh, potentially in Spinoza's works. Uh, he, he may not be uh, all the way there, and I, I understand these are you know, we're just trying out these uh, phrases, but uh, but certainly there's more emphasis on uh, on love, uh, and and there's. More openness to federalism, which, and I know Dr. Field, you, you pointed out again. There's there's suggestions in the political treatise, and, and you still have one one capital city. But uh, so absolutely on that point, th thanks, Chris, for the encouragement to to think that through uh, to a to a greater extent. And then uh, contract uh, plus uh, versus 
contract uh, minus, uh, let me make sure I'm understanding your question there the right way is it, because it doesn't necessarily have to do with secularization, but it's, you are asking about, may I ask you to, to mm. just run that yes, by me one uh, more time? I, so far. I, I think that's a very delicate way of saying <laughs> I wasn't very clear. Um, let me, yeah. let me have another go. Yeah. Let me have another go. Yeah. So th th there would be two ways of, at least two ways of thinking about the difference between covenants and contracts uh, that, that you can imagine. The first one would be that historically speaking, in the sort of pre-modern past, you have covenants which are made before the deity. There's a religious aspect to them. One sacrifices, one takes oaths and so forth. And then in modernity, um, you know, because of the, the desire to secularize and in various ways, there's a, a desire to keep the, the essence of that holding oneself to a commitment, keeping one's word, but to take away all the, the religious side of it. And so what the contract would be fundamentally from that perspective would be a non-religious covenant, covenant with all the religion taken out. Um, but, th but there would be another way to think about it, which would be that, no, historically, actually, the, the contract is the fundamental concept. And, you, you know, you can go right back to the, the Code of Hammurabi and so forth, and there are, there's evidence that, that these agreements, these trade agreements were made, you know, way back when. Um, and that's the, the, um, the, the concept at the core of all this. And then what covenant does is it embroiders that, that concept. And so the, the first of these would be Charles Taylor's idea of a subtraction story, you, you try and take away something that's there um, in order to end up with a purified version of it. And, and the second would be more of um, that the contracts are not a subtraction story, um, that they're the, the fundamental yeah. idea that covenant then goes and adds something to it, a sort of a, an addition story, if you like. And, and I guess what's at stake in that is what is the fundamental concept here, if there is one, and... And what is the relationship, therefore, between contracts and covenant? Is one of them the, the, the framework within which the other one is operating? Okay. No, no, I, I appreciate it. And that, just to emphasize, that was, that was crystal clear. I think probably I was, I was not processing uh, correctly. So <clears throat> my intuition, and I, I can't justify this historically, and I want to be cautious about bringing in possibilities of, of human uh, purpose, but my, I'm drawn to the idea that the uh, the contract would be covenant minus. And I, I think of just in terms of what's humanly satisfying. And again, without trying to specify in advance what the correct understanding of love or the higher principle uh, would be. I mean, this, this, the, your question takes me back, I think, to Plato's Republic uh, and you know the city of sows and why exactly that is not satisfying because there's very much that sort of basic minimal stripped down understanding of contract that's explored by Glaucon and Adimantus with Socrates uh, before, you know, there's the objection, but the city doesn't have relishes, uh, right? So we, we need something higher. We need something uh, to add beyond, you know, a merely economic uh, understanding of contract. So again, I'd want to be very cautious <clears throat> in terms of suggesting, you know, what the higher principle that, that somehow I'm suggesting is fundamental is or uh, should be. And I, I don't want to speak historically and, and make claims that, that aren't supported historically, but I wonder whether just in terms of fundamental human aspirations, you know, covenant isn't primary because we do long for something beyond just an agreement that advances utility or that um, allows us to to dominate others. So thank you so much for that challenging question. I, I need to think that through. Uh, I, I can see it at greater length. No, that's, that's wonderful. That's really, really helpful. And of course is if utility is the guiding notion, then sort of Machiavelli lurks around the corner, one would suspect. And you yes, know, what, yeah. what, what is left of contract? Um, if utility is the only, is the only value. Um, sadly, we, we have, um, I was going to say run up against the buffers. We, we have gracefully glided into land, let us say, um, at the end of this seminar. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone present will uh, wholeheartedly want to join me.
uh, in thanking you for a really rich um, sort of ranging over a, a, a broad historical spread and tying all these ideas together and the the really rich way in which you engage with the questions as well. So please do, everybody, join with me uh, in thanking uh, Bolek Kavala for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. it means a lot. Thank you. Thank you.